Yep. There it is. This, now we're official. The magic clock on the wall says five, ooh, 501. So uh, I, I was going to wear my black tie for this, <laughs> like all my professors did during this final exams. I was taking, uh, 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 I know everyone knows I meander. So here's my first meander. So when I was in grad school, I was taking what I believed was my last final exam in systems, aquaculture systems. And my professor came up to me and he said, I was looking at your transcripts and it turns out you still have two classes you have to take. And I was sure I was all done. It was my last final. And he said, uh, you have to take statistics 401 and biochemistry 583. And I'm like, Nah, you're kidding me. And he said, no, you, you have to take those to graduate. So I had to go back another semester to take two of the most dreaded classes in the world. And so uh, the final, uh, which I thought I was going to blow, because he told me that before I started the final, not after. Uh, I thought I'd really do badly on it, but I did okay. So here I am, your, your uh, adjunct professor in aquaculture after I passed that final. I did, I will let you know that I almost failed the biochemistry 581 outright. That was the hardest class I, I ever took in my life and uh, I was way too old for it. So with that as a disclaimer, uh, no worries about taking the final exam, which is, I even have a copy here in front of me. So here's what we're gonna do. And people are gonna come in uh, probably they're going to start popping in as as we're doing this. But this, since it's recorded, uh, this is for everybody's uh, posterity and edification. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, let we're we're going to just read off, go down the final exam, and we're going to ask the question, answer the question then review all the information you want to know. This is an open forum. This is, this is really a yearly review. And it's also, you know, I've given this final exam uh, pretty much the same one. <laughs> it changes a little bit, but for the last, you know, 21 years. Uh, and everybody always fails it, which is the only consistent thing about what I do is having everyone fail the final. Uh, but um, it's, it's really just to review all the stuff. I have people that come to the final exam. It's their first time they've ever come. So, you know, how could they not fail it? And, uh, you know, on that note, the stuff that we do at SPAT is uh, very quirky. There's not a lot of people in the country that know this material. So it's taken me, I've been at it for about 30 something years and I still learn stuff all the time, all the time, all the time, all the time. So, you know, I never expect anybody to, uh, to be proficient at the language that quickly. I do uh, try to get students that come in to, um, to learn the material so that if they go to a, uh, an interview or something that they're gonna wow their interviewer because the interviewer would, will not have heard any of the information. But for everyone else, it, it really is the one-liners for cocktail parties and it's the, uh, it, 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 it's the way of attempting to one up your neighbor and stuff like that. But other than that, uh, the information is there for you. And so we're gonna go through this. Um, so here we go. Question number one, and these are uh, true false. All the algae grown at uh, Cornell uh, must be local species uh, so that uh, they won't be introduced non-native varieties to the water. 
true or false? Uh, raise of hands. Oh, nobody's on here except for Sunday. Everybody's got their videos off, which is fine. Okay, so everybody jot down their true or false. And the answer is, since Sunday's up, is the answer is what? You don't have this is to a lot of this is a lot of pressure. Um, I would say um, it should be true, but and oh oh see now what is you know when you were in college and taking a final exam, did you have the uh, luxury of saying uh, true, but you know you're <laughs> no, but but in this day and age, they're always so intense about not introducing species yeah. that are. And, and, to our and area and other the, things. So I'm just saying town that. Hall, and you're paying attention to all the things that happen in town hall. You're mm -hmm. absolutely right that that's what people should think. <laughs> and the answer is false. Uh, none of the ones we grow are are indigenous species. There might be one. We grow a uh, uh, a species of a diatom called Ketoceros. The one that's in our waters uh, is Ketoceros calcitrans, and that is a local diatom that grows in our waters. And what's interesting about uh, diatoms and Ketoceros is, I believe, it's it's pretty cold water tolerant species. So I would I believe it's the first local algae that shellfish begin to eat once winter is over. And what's interesting about that is, and it might not be Ketoceros calcitrans, but it's certainly uh, in the water. And these, these algaes, uh, I don't know if this is absolutely the truth with Ketoceros. Ketoceros is a diatom. And the difference between a diatom and other algaes is Ketoceros uses silica in its process of growing, which is kind of like glass-like. They have a silica test or kind of very thin layer, one, one cell layer shell-ish thing. They call it a test. And it's, uh, it, it's what makes diatoms different than other species. Now, the only reason I bring that up is, a lot of times in the early spring, the water looks pretty darn clear. Okay, is that Richie? Hey, Richie. He's muted, but I saw the wave before. I thought you were waving goodbye like Darcy's leaving. Goodbye. Uh, so the water will look really clear. But if you look at some of the shellfish in, in April, uh, even, even in March and April, you'll see new shell growth on it. So they're eating something. So I believe it's that, the ketoceros. All the other species of algae we grow are aquacultural high-grade algae. So we grow T. iso. And I don't know if it's in here. T. iso. What's the T stand for? Anybody know? And you can shout out since you're all muted. Uh, yeah, well, you know. Uh, the... The T in ISO is Tahiti. It's Tahitian Isochrysis galbana. So it's clearly not local. Uh, I believe the reason that the regulatory agents don't worry about us putting these algaes in the water is that basically none of them are cold water tolerant. So they're not going to survive the winter. They're not gonna bloom up and take over. Uh, if they did, we probably would have gigantic shellfish all over the place, but uh, that that isn't the issue, and and it it never is an issue with the regulatory agents. Um, if it were, any sort of release of algae into the creeks, we'd have to kill it first. We'd have to like bleach it or something, and. They don't make us do that, which is really handy. And I have yet to see a bloom of any of these things we grow, even in the summer. So uh, they 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 really aren't rigged for growing in our waters per se. Uh, anybody that wants to learn more about algae, we have our own algae room. 
uh, it's run by and and very experimentally run by uh, SPAT volunteers. And that will be the first thing that happens right after New Year's is really gearing up the algae and getting uh, algae up and running. So if you'd like to be a part of that, uh, by all means, come by the Marine Center, our regular hours, my office hours, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, eight, eight to noon, and we'll show you all, everything you want to know about algae. There also is the algae to algae lectures that were recorded on our website if you wanted to pay more attention to algae. So that's algae. And that will be the first lecture. I haven't decided exactly how we're going to do the lectures next year. I think I'll do one live at the Marine Center and one and, and still do a Zoom. Uh, but the way that COVID's going and all this stuff, who knows if we'll ever see people again in person. Um, anyway. Okay, question number, did everyone get that wrong? I hope so. You're supposed to get all of these wrong. That's how I know that I, I'm on, on target with this final exam, so that nobody ever gets anything right. Okay. I once had a final exam, here it goes meandering again. I once had a final exam where uh, it was all true, false, and multiple guess, and all the answers were true, and all the multiple guess were all correct, and still everyone got it all wrong. So just to let you know, there's no, there's no trick to this. It just is a disaster. Okay. Uh, the blue point oyster, Crassostera virginica, is a different species of oyster from the Louisiana oyster, Crassostera gigas. True or false? Anyone can text or jump in or unmute or Port Sunday is the only one live here. <laughs> yes, answer all. She's true. I'm saying true also. That's awesome. I'm so glad you said that because it's absolutely false. <laughs> So, so, we're, so we're, we're, we're definitely on track for a complete, complete success on my end. So, you know, I'm a tricky guy. Uh, and there are some things over time, like you could, you could carry this final exam around with you to the store and to your different thing. You know, remind you of, of the things that are part of your cocktail one-liners. For instance, all the oysters on the East Coast are one species, Crassostria virginica, okay? So there is no other species of oyster on the East Coast legally in the water. You might be able to go to a fish market and buy Crassostria gigas, that's the Pacific oyster that is the number one oyster grown in, in the world. It's grown by the Chinese, the Japanese. I'm told the Australians are now growing it. That west coast of the United States, uh, all of Europe, it is the main oyster. And it's not indigenous to most of those places. It's indigenous to Japan, but it certainly isn't indigenous to Scotland. I don't know if anyone, saw in the paper, I think about a year ago, where the Scots were complaining about too many oysters in their waters. Uh, and it's because they were these evasive species that crash Austria gigas, the Pacific oyster, and they wanted their European flat oyster back. So there was some comment that saying, well, why don't you let more of the Chinese in? They'll take care of your oyster problem for you, uh, which I thought was kind of a little, uh, whatever it was. That's not the answer for, for taking care of your indigenous species, having another group of people come in and eat it all up for you. They might have, but blue point oysters, Chincoteague from, from, the, from the Del Marva Peninsula, uh, Louisiana oysters, however they're branded, uh, Malpec oysters from Canada, Wellfleet oysters, uh, on and on and on and on are all the same oyster. So the Kumamoto is a different, yes, go ahead, question. Question, so um, the, the seed that you give us every year are Blue Point oysters then? Oh, you know, thanks for bringing that up because the thing with Blue Point oysters is that back in the day, 
Blue Point oysters were the oyster that sold out four times faster than any other oyster. They were from Blue Point, New York, grown in Blue Point, and they were world famous and marketed very well. And so our Eastern oyster almost took on this, this uh, uh, alias of the Blue Point oyster. Are those Blue Points? Well, they are the Blue Point oyster, but they're not the Blue Point oyster because the real Blue Point oyster doesn't actually exist anymore because it's not grown in Blue Point. But because they marketed them so well, there's two companies, Blue Point Oyster and Blue Points. They're both trademarked and they sell very well and neither of them are grown in Blue Point. So, you know, it, it's all about the branding. And how many times have people said, are those blue points? It's almost like saying, you know, when I was in, in grad school, my professor used to really explode whenever you called the Northern Quahog, the hard shell clam. Okay, our, our regular clam that we eat, our, our, you know, our clam, not the surf clam, not the steamer clam, our regular clam, is its indigenous name, its actual name, common name, is the Northern Quahog. And that's uh, Mercenaria Mercenaria. That's the Northern Quahog. To call it a hard shell clam is a blanket term for all hard shell clams. Surf clams a hard shell clam. Uh, cockles are hard shell clams. There's a lot of hard shell clams. So, you know, when you're, if you were in Europe and you called uh, a bellon, uh, which is a European flat oyster that was in the waters of bellon, you can't call a bellon a bellon if it wasn't in bellon. It, it, it's just a European flat oyster. It has to hit the waters of bellon to become a bellon oyster. And so Blue Point should, be, should have to spend some of its life in Blue Point to be called that, but we're not, we're not as- so, so what's the answer then? If somebody sits down to eat oysters that I've grown at Tiana, am I supposed to say they're Tiana oysters? Or? No, 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 no. If you <laughs> brew them, you're supposed to absolutely have your own brand name. Oh boy. Like for instance, Bart Burke, the happy oyster, it's the happy oyster. Uh, oyster Ponds, oyster, a widow's hole, uh, great gun. Bay box oysters. Bay box oysters. <laughs> I mean, I was gonna say bay box oyster with that <laughs> if you start, or cedary flavor, mahogany <laughs> bay box out of. But I mean, that that's basically the bottom, the bottom line is that uh, back when an oyster was an oyster and it was wild harvest, maybe, uh, an oyster was an oyster, you could call it, a, you could kind of get away with, you know, a, a, a broad term like that. But now it's all about boutiquing. Everybody boutiques their oysters. So, uh, you and, and that's important. When I was in grad school, how many times are you going to bring that up? Because we're taking the final exam. I went to school with Skid Row, Dr. Skid Row to you, uh, Bob Rowe. And he had a company called the Moonstone Oyster. And he was one of the first aquaculturists to really brand his oyster. And it was in every high-end magazine in New York. Uh, the Moonstone Oyster, and it still exists and it's still known very well. If you go to the Grand Central Oyster Bar and you look at their menu, uh, uh, and I hear it's back in business, and there's 26 oysters on the menu, you're going to see 15 of them that are the Eastern Oyster with a brand name, including Blue Point. They probably don't have Blue Point and Blue Points. That would be too confusing, but they will, they'll have, you know, all the other ones down the list as a as a, a branded name so that's that okay and those are important things for you to remember and to share is that on the east coast our indigenous oyster 
is one oyster, Crassostria virginica, from Newfoundland to the Texas Panhandle, and nothing else is allowed to be grown there. And it doesn't mean that you can't get other oysters in a restaurant but or in a fish market, but you can't get it from the water, and we're not allowed to grow them. And, and I would say that one of the reasons why not, we're not allowed to grow them is the Eastern oyster is only found on the east coast of the United States. It's not found anywhere else. It is a our cherished species of oyster. And so uh, like question one, see, I, I, I wonder if we're gonna even get to question five before you go to your birthday. Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so either. Well, I'll pick up the, well, it's supposed to be, a. we'll try to keep this at an hour so everyone can go, go eat dinner. I've got, my, I've got my oyster stew here, but I can't eat it. <laughs> Uh, uh, like your first question of non-indigenous species, you know, we're, the East Coast is very, very particular about not gumming up our native oyster with something else that could come in and outcompete it. Okay, and I could go on for hours and hours about that, but uh, there's, I think that there's some of the lectures have have that mentioned in it. The black line seen on many of the oysters cultured in New York may be an indication of disease resistant stock from early hatchery breeding practices. Anybody? False. Thank you very much for being <laughs> as consistent as the day is long. <laughs> okay. Maybe you're doing it on purpose. Um, Back in 19, when I was in grad school <laughs> with Bob Rowe from Moonstone Oysters, he said to me, I got my PhD in this stuff. I've been running Moonstone Oysters for 10 years and nobody can tell me why 90% of my oyster seed just died. And the reason why it just died in 1992 was a disease that popped up at the time called juvenile oyster disease. And it hit uh, the stock from Frank M. Flower and Sons in Oyster Bay where Skid got his seed. And Frank M. Flower and Sons uh, lost 90% of their oysters in 92. And <clears throat> it turns out that it's a disease that you can breed out of the system. So they took survivors that some of the 10% that survived bred them the next year class, it was 50% mortality. They bred those 50% mortality, got down to 25 and ended up getting this disease, juvenile oyster disease out of the system. People were trying to figure out what it was. There was a big battle. Turns out it's a bacteria. It's now called Rosia varus, the, uh, the disease. And what happened was when Dave Relier was using his Root stock to breed this disease resistance out of the oysters. He had a color morph on, in the shell. It had a black line, and it and it transferred to all the stock. So, if you see an oyster with a black line going up the center of it, that's a very good uh, potential indication that that's from that stock that was bred with the disease resistance. Now, the, the line has nothing to do with the disease resistance. It's just a color morph that is part of the genetics. The disease resistance was the disease resistance uh, itself, and but the two are there. So it's kind of a neat little marker. So that was true, actually. Oysters can freeze solid and still live. Hey, Kim. Yes, sir. How, how often do you see that black line or do people we see, see it? it? It's in all of our oysters. Yeah. Because what happened was we've continued to, to use that stock for brood stock for our oysters. They have a black line and it transfers. And, uh, you know, there you, you can also tell sometimes uh, in New York, for instance, if you get a New York oyster, that doesn't have the black line. There's a good chance it's from Fisher's Island because he never used any of that brood stock. Uh, so if it doesn't have the line, it doesn't really mean all that much, but it might mean one thing. It might mean that that oyster is what's called naive to the disease. So if you put 
an oyster that's naive to the disease, uh, if, if, you, if you have that in the population and you get the disease, their offspring will die before it reaches the size of the dime. So kind of interesting. And hopefully they won't. But we had it. We had it big time, right in Cedar Beach. I mean, it, not, everything died until it was bred out of the system. So now how about the, o those oysters freezing solid? Oysters can freeze solid and still live. True. True. This is just the most awesome final exam I think I've ever given. Uh, they're not woolly mammoths. Yes. Well, no. Uh, you can't, you, you, oysters have a antifreeze glycoprotein in their blood, which keeps them from forming ice inside when it's really cold. I've had oysters that have ice inside and they're still alive. But if you freeze an oyster solid, like put it in the freezer for a week and then thaw it out, it's definitely gonna be dead, okay? Part of the overwintering lecture is trying to convince people just to get them below potential ice field that comes by. Because if they lock in in ice, for any length of time, they're probably going to die. So um, that was uh, that was false. <laughs> awesome, this is great. Metamorphosis in shellfish is irreversible and causes significant internal morphological changes, including rapid growth of the gills uh, of shell and gill structure. Wow, that's a pretty. Uh, I think I put that in because that was in when I was in grad school and defending my thesis. Uh, that's one of my thesis committee asked me that question. And uh, I think I got it partially right, but not all right. So anyone on that? Metamorphosis in shellfish is irreversible, causes internal morphological changes, including rapid growth in, of, of the shell and gill structure. No idea. True. true. That's true. Janet, you got the first one right so far. Yes, that is true. And, and what I'd like people to do at some point, and, and we'll try to post this. I've got to take some new videos of one day old shellfish larvae that has undergone, not shellfish larvae, one day old post metamorphic boy, uh, shellfish. So their larvae, they undergo metamorphosis and they become spat. And that first day, it's remarkable to look at them under a microscope. So I'll, I'll get you some, I'll, I'll, we'll put, put that up on, on our website at some point because it's really fascinating to see this remarkable explosion of change that metamorphosis brings within literally hours of, of it happening. And uh, I've, I'm always fascinated by looking at that. The principal reason for employing upweller systems is to increase the flow rate of the water passing through a volume of shellfish seed. Janet? <laughs> well, you're pun true. What? True, I have to unmute, true. Mm -hmm. That is true. And You know, I'm just, it's dawning on me that these questions are in order of the lecture series that comes up. So it was algae and then broodstock conditioning and spawning and larval rearing and, and post set and now systems. So the whole thing about systems and all of these, all of these uh, lectures or whatever they are, Zoom meetings, are on our website, so you can go back and look at them. So the one on uh, systems would talk about this flow rate of, of water, and there's a question uh, coming down at the bottom about seston flux that we'll talk about when we get down to the bottom there. Uh, but it's all about flow. Uh, and in nature, good natural flow is, is a real plus. It, it's, uh, it, it, it's what allows shellfish to feed on the hopefully abundant algae that's that's out there. And uh, 
So flow is flow is very important. And uh, that's what we use our different uh, aquaculture systems to tweak that part of the equation of flow that we're, we're going to talk about later on. Oysters should never be left out of the water for longer than three days. Remember, this is, oh, this is true false. So you got a 50 50 chance. So, has anyone ever left oysters out of the water for longer than three days and they're still alive? I will let you know that. No. No? No, I've never left them out of the water and I think they would die. Well, that's very good of you. Uh, I'm going to say that whether you said true or false, I'll give it to you because it really depends on the season. If it's, if it's summertime and it's really hot and you take oysters out of the water, uh, you can definitely kill them. You can definitely cook them. The, the heat, they can open up, they can spill all their fluids out. Uh, we had actually this year had some problems with people leaving their oysters out just for a day, or as they claimed it was just for a day. I didn't really, I didn't really put the screws to them to find out if it was more like, well, a week, it was maybe a day. I can't remember. It was it a day or a week? I can't remember. Well, uh, but in the winter time, right about now up in Wellfleet, the oyster folks, are taking all of their oysters off of the flats. Maybe in another month, they're gonna do that. Uh, they take all their oysters off of the flats and they put them in containers on the shore for three months and then put them back in the water in, in mid-March. So they can stay out of the water for months and live. Um, back in the day, back in the 1900s, one of the beauties of the oyster was you could put them in a cask and throw a piece of burlap and some seaweed on them and ship them over to, to Europe on a, on a ship and they'd be out of the water for weeks uh, in transit and with no refrigeration because they didn't have refrigeration. So they were really one of these animals that you could keep uh, cool and last for a long, long time. So in general, they're pretty hardy, but do be careful uh, of, of the temperature because if they're in the cool, they can stay out for, for a very long time, including in your refrigerator. Um, I know because this oyster stew, I made from oysters that were in the bed of my pickup truck for at least four days. And then I remember they were in the bed of my pickup truck. So I made this stew and there it is. There's the oyster, and it's just fine. Yeah. It looks now, good. If I, eat it, if I eat it in front of you and I pass out, you're going to say, well, let's go eat that. We need your recipe. <laughs> oh, it's, I, I will give you, you know, if people are getting ready for the holidays, uh, there's all kinds of very easy recipes that will wow the masses, including oyster stew, which is the simplest thing, but it's almost you can't fail. Yep, and there's the cookbook. Did you? I was just telling somebody the other day. Oh, we had we had a, a send off for Armand, which was really quite a emotional and great turnout. We have some pictures that we'll post, and uh, we're talking about the cookbook. There were some members that had been part of the SPAT program back in the day, the cookbook, and I mentioned to them that. Uh, we had sold 5,000 copies of that book. And the last three that I wow, bought straight. were on Amazon. <laughs> you can actually find them on Amazon once in a while. When I first came out to South Pole, Janice, uh, she gave me. Oh, good. Coffee. Yeah. Is there a recipe for oyster stew in there? I'm sure there's several. <laughs> well, a real oyster stew is the simplest of all. This thing that I made is actually not an oyster stew. It's an oyster chowder because I put potatoes and onions and uh, a whole celery. I made it like a clam chowder, but it's got oysters in it. So. An oyster stew only has oysters, milk or heavy cream, butter, 
and black pepper. That's, and I add mushrooms because mushrooms, when you cook mushrooms with oysters, they taste just like oysters. So if you only have two dozen oysters, but you have a whole bunch of people coming over, put mushrooms in and it'll stretch it way out. And, and so that's a little trick. Dermo, Perkensis marinus, is a rare oyster disease that only affects oysters in the Chesapeake Bay. Yes, no, maybe. Shelly, guess. Ooh. Um, it, I know that they do get affected over there, but I don't know if it's Dermo or that other one. MSX. Yeah. So I don't know. I just know you say don't eat shellfish from the south most of the time. Oh, yeah, but that's not okay. So we're going to talk about that. But just give me a true or false on that. And then we'll I'm going to say true. Okay. That uh, is false. Dermo is probably in all of our oysters. As a matter of fact, if people noticed that they had higher mortality this year in their two year old oysters than they they're used to, which People are telling me, a lot of the oyster growers are telling me, they told me this yesterday at, 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 uh, when I was, uh, or on Wednesday, uh, we had a bunch of growers at Armand's thing. And just about every one of them said that they had seen between, you know, really high mortality this year. And I think it's because of dermo pressure from a relatively mild winter we had last year. Now you might say it wasn't a mild winter last year, in the grand scheme of things, especially in the oyster grand scheme of things, it was considered a mild winter. Uh, a hard winter, you'd, you'd get ice on, on the bay in a hard winter. So uh, Dermo was one of the two oyster diseases in the Chesapeake that pretty much white, uh, knocked them back silly for the last 40 plus years. Uh, when shellfish was transferred from south to north, it spread dermo. So dermo is probably ubiquitous in our waters and in our oysters. You can work around it and you can eat shellfish that has dermo um, and it won't affect you. Dermo shows mortality in let's say you have a bag of oysters, it's a hundred oysters and they're perfect and you did them on Monday and you go back the next Monday or so and you notice five of them are dead and, you're, and you say, I just did these a week ago. That could be derma because that's how it shows itself. It's incremental losses. It's not, you go to look at your oysters and they're all dead. That would be more like MSX, multinucleated spheroid unknown uh, Haplosporidium nelsoni. Now, you're writing all this down, right? 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 Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Michael, writing it down? No. no. You, you should have these little pieces of paper in each bay box. Uh, yeah. No. So dermo is not rare, unfortunately. And um, it, it, it doesn't affect our oysters as badly as it does in the Chesapeake. We, we can manage around it. Uh, but I would say, don't try to keep two and three year old oysters uh, as eat them and get new ones because you're gonna see higher mortality in older oysters if they have derma. The primary food source for shellfish is unicellular microalgae, regardless of the size or life stage of the animal. True? Did I hear it true? Good, everyone's saying true, yes. You know, I've, I should probably preface this in, in case anybody from the science world ever watches this video in the final exam. There's, you know, shellfish take in uh, everything that's in the water. Now, do they incorporate it in their body? For the most part, what I'm going to say is unicellular microalgae is the most significant food source for shellfish. Without it, they're not gonna make it. Shellfish cannot exist on detritus. 
Shellfish can't exist on bacteria. They can't exist on uh, little protozoans. They need unicellular microalgae. That's their primary diet. So I would, I, I say that's true. I've read literature that says that shellfish can take in, you know, this and that and that and they incorporate it, but that's fine. I'm not saying that they can't. I'm just saying they, they, they can't survive without unicellular microalgae. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll get an email from some highfalutin researcher that says, I grow all of my oysters on pure yeast. Really? Okay. Yeah. With that bready taste, you know, nice bready taste. Okay. Greenport and the Peconic Bay once had prolific natural oyster reefs which were harvested at the peak at the turn of the century, 20th century. True, false? Greenport and Peconic Bay. Greenport and Peconic Bay in 1900 was one of the greatest producers of oysters around. And they had no natural oyster reefs. It was aquaculture back then. They would bring the seed up, so that's false. They would bring the, the, the seed from seed beds, dump it into Peconic Bay, which it grew great there because they were taking the seed from, let's say, more brackish, less salty waters. Up oh, the birthday girl's getting ready to, to go. I see that, I see that. Make sure you spend a lot of money on her. Yep. Okay. So that was aquaculture back then. Uh, there were no prolific. There were some reefs. Uh, there was supposed to be a very big reef off of Horton's Lighthouse uh, that was silted over during the 38 hurricane. Uh, oyster ponds must have gotten its name from having lots of oysters in the ponds. Uh, but as far as big reefs like they had in Manhattan, that was a big reef. That was a huge reef of oysters in Manhattan. And we didn't have that. We, we, it wasn't the same environment. Good. Everyone did great. Uh, I think it was eight wrong out of 10. So that's awesome. You're living up to my highest standards of, of not failure, by the way, of, of the, 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 the necessity to uh, keep learning, and keep learning, and keep learning, keep learning. Okay, you can keep getting it wrong. I didn't want to disappoint you. If you're talking to anybody, see, here's the different. Here's a subtle difference. When I'm talking to you, you must believe everything I tell you. When you're talking to somebody else, you're hoping that everything you say they'll believe. You. Okay, but you would like to get the stuff right so that you're not passing on misinformation. And we know about misinformation in this day and age, okay? I'm not gonna go there, but let's just say this is the age of misinformation. Okay, so this, that's why you have to carry this around with you when you go to the supermarket. So if you run into somebody, you can look it up and say, cause you're all correcting your exam, right? You can say, oh, no, 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 that's not the way it is, okay? This is the way it is, okay. Multiple guess. Okay. The Seston flux, it should say the Seston flux equation states algae times flow equals growth. Oh, well, <laughs> I just gave you the answer. Aeration times food equals growth. Anatomy coupled with fertility equals genetic. Wow, genetic index. <laughs> I like that. Uh, aquinetics through fluid propulsion. If, wow. I, I didn't even read this thing. This is awesome. Those are the most harebrained answers I've ever seen. The Seston flux equation states that algae concentration times flow equals growth. That was the answer to that one. All the other ones were really <laughs> me in a mood, let's say. Okay. And what's interesting about the Seston flux equation is what we talked about before with systems and flow rate. The Seston flux equation which is a very broad term, states that the amount of algae 
times the flow rate of this algae through the animals will equal growth, which is a, a very kind of broad statement. But if you, if you treat it for what it is, if you have 6,000 gallons per minute flow and no algae, how much growth do you get? 6,000 times zero equals zero. If you have 6 million cells per milliliter of algae and no flow, theoretically, you get no growth either. So in nature, uh, we can't control either one of those things. We can't control the flow in nature per se. We can't control the algae concentration legally. Uh, we can't dump fertilizer into the bay. And, you know, they used to do that. Plock used to do that over at Raiden Shores. He had, a, he had a little part of the bay that he closed off and he would dump fertilizer in there and spike the algae and flow it through his, his cultures. Uh, you can't do that legally. But in an, in an aquaculture setting like we have, you can't alter the algae concentration in the nursery system. You can do it in the hatchery because we're growing our own algae. But in the nursery system, you can tweak the flow part of that equation tremendously. And that's what we do with all of our systems. Each one of the systems has a different flow rate. Downweller, flow rate of one, let's say. Land-based upweller, flow rate of 10, let's say. Floating upweller, flow rate of 100. And so it's an order of magnitude greater each time. And that's, the, that's what allows them to grow so fast. Okay, the Eastern oyster. That's our famous oyster. You gotta learn it. And you know it's I'm gonna cut out, thank you. A happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to Thanks you. Thanks so much. Two verses of that, and that, so that was it. Well, happy birthday, Sunday. Thank you, Darcy. Um, Thanks, Michelle. Bye -bye. Yes, have him buy you nice things. <laughs> no oysters on the menu, though. <laughs> we have plenty of our own. Good, good, good. Uh, Eastern oyster has a two-year maximum lifespan. No. Has a muscular foot for movement. No. So two-year lifespan, that would have been a scallop, 18 months. Oysters can live for 35 years. Uh, muscular foot, that would be the northern quahog not to be confused by the hard shell clam. Uh, a a, a pro is a protantric hermaphrodite. That's true. Did you know that? Oysters all start their lives as males. So all the seed, pretty much all the seed that you get are all males. And then early in their life span, they will switch. At usually 50 50, 50% 50 male, 50% female, but they all start off, they're protandric. The literature says that they can also switch back. And I use a scientific term that says they probably can't do it willy nilly. That's a sci my scientific term, willy nilly. Yeah. Uh, which means they can probably switch if they're stressed, if the environment is stressed and you need, you know, I say this often and I, and I'll stick to it. Oysters like males, uh, like, like humans, the males are practically worthless. It's the females that make the eggs. So, you know, you can have a, the Charlton Heston of oysters uh, to take care of, you know, the future but he can't make a, an egg. So, uh, so if the population is waning, you might have oysters switching to more female. Could possibly happen. Scallops are, are serial hermaphrodites. They're both male and female their, their whole lives. So one scallop can actually bring back a population. They can self-fertilize and make off, uh, offspring uh, with one scallop, which is kind of fascinating. Uh, a true nacre layer, no, they don't. The nacre layer is the mother of pearl layer, okay? 
Our oysters don't have that. How many times have people said, I, I want to find a pearl? Well, you're not going to find a real pearl in an oyster. You could find a real pearl in a clam because they have a true nacre layer. Uh, the pearl oyster that everyone thinks of as cultured pearl, that's the Japanese black pearl oyster. Pinctata margaritifera. You're writing this down, right? Is that when they inject them with sand? Uh, they, in, <laughs> you know, any irritant that's in between the layer and, uh, and the body it, it what, what the oyster's trying to do is coat the irritant so that it won't be abrasive and kill the animal. So they say sand, if a piece of sand gets in there, that's an irritant and it will laminate it with the nacre layer and make a pearl. The way they do it with the, with the cultured pearls is they actually inject, and when I say inject, I have, I have a lecture on this and maybe I should give it someday. Um, shows a guy with these, they almost look like welding goggles, these big things. And he's got these long tweezers and he's putting in a plastic bead. Because, I mean, I don't know if you've ever gone to a pearl party where everyone gets a can with an oyster in it and you open it up and it, it's disgusting. I, I used to do it. <laughs> I used to, to do these things at a uh, 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 junior high school. Every, it, they, the teacher would buy all these cans for each of the students. They'd have their own oyster. They open it up and they'd get each get a pearl. And the reason why it was disgusting is that these things were canned in like formaldehyde. They were, it was, it was awful, but they'd each get this pearl. And the pearl was, the reason why you could buy the can of oyster with the pearl in it for like 10 bucks is the pearl was almost valueless. It was 90% or 99% plastic and a thin laminate of actual pearl. So that's how you get a, a, a good cultured pearl. You might take a shell chip or something and let it grow for years and make a, really, a, a, a real cultured pearl. And those would be expensive. Uh, found throughout the East Coast of the United States, true. Stops growing south of the Carolinas, that's false. Okay, so that was that, anyone got that? Which of the following are predators? Okay, oyster toadfish, is that a predator of oysters? O oyster toadfish, sounds like it would be a predator. And if you've seen pictures of oyster toadfish, they're really gnarly, they look like stonefish uh, and they've got a big mouth with teeth but they're actually not a predator. They're actually helpful to the oysters. They eat crabs and other things. Uh, some people say they eat oysters. I, I, don't, I, I don't believe that. Uh, I've found oyster toadfish in, in so many of my cages and uh, they're not eating the oysters. They're eating the crabs and other things. Uh, oyster drill, that's the little snail. That's a, that's a voracious predator, even though it's tiny. See how tiny it is? Uh, it can eat a, a, a full grown oyster. And the way it does it is it bores a fine hole like a Dremel with its radula and then injects digestive fluids into the oyster and liquefies it and that's how it eats it. Uh, the boring sponge. The boring sponge is, is the thing that gets in an oyster and digests the shell and calcium and it makes holes all over the shell, but it's actually not a predator. It's not after the oyster, it's after the calcium. So it's, it, 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 it's not really a predator. Uh, sea squirt, our friend, the sea squirt. That's also, I mean, sometimes you open up an oyster or you open up your oyster cage and you'll see an oyster and it's dead and there are sea squirts in it. And you say, oh, the sea squirt ate this oyster. It didn't. It, it, the sea squirt doesn't, isn't a predator. It just happens to be inside the oyster that's no longer there. Oyster catcher, that's the bird with a long orange, uh, red bill. And that's a, that's a predator of oysters. They call it an oyster catcher because it eats oysters. Club tunicate, that's the 
that's the thing that looks like a chicken leg if you really let it grow big. Uh, and that's not a predator. Mud crab, that's a predator. That's one of the most ubiquitous uh, predators that we have. We, the mud crabs, gazillion mud crabs. The pea crab is the crab that lives inside the oyster. That's not a predator. That's actually in a symbiotic relationship with the oyster. It, it gets protection and a habitat. The oyster doesn't get much out of it. So it's what's called a uh, commensal uh, symbiotic relationship. One, one tolerates it, but doesn't get much benefit. Uh, the knobbed whelk, voracious predator of shellfish, uh, eats, eats shellfish kind of the same way that the oyster drill does. Red beard sponge, that's not a predator. Grass shrimp, that's not a predator. Filamentous algae, that's not a predator. So same question, which are fowlers? Toadfish, that's not a fowler. Oyster drill, that was a predator. It's not a fowler. The boring sponge, you could think of that possibly as being a fouling organism, but it's, 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 uh, it doesn't really foul aquaculture gear. It just wreaks havoc with the oyster. Sea squirts are tremendous fouling organisms, and you can get your cages to weigh an extra 100 pounds of, of sea squirts if you, don't, if you don't keep up with them. Oyster catcher, nah, they're, they're not fowlers. They're quite beautiful, actually. T Club tunicate is a fouling organism. Mud crabs was the predator. Pea crabs commensal. Knob whelks a predator. Redbeard sponge is a, can be a fowler. It gets all over the, the gear. There's some pictures that I have that uh, James Wojcik took that shows redbeard sponge like completely occluding all the mesh of the uh, of the cages. Grass shrimp, nope, they're not a fowler. Filamentous algae can be a fowler. You pick up your gear and it's covered with. It looks like Willie Nelson, then that, that's a fowler. Willie Nelson, I should have put Willie Nelson down here. He's a fowler. Yeah, foul mouth, Willie Nelson. Okay, which of the following can affect the growth of shellfish? Algae concentration. We already said Seston flux equation definitely has an impact on growth rate of shellfish. The more good algae, faster they're gonna grow. Uh, uh, harmful allergies like brown tide, you can get them to do the opposite. So it's got to be, uh, it, it, oh, the question was, can affect growth? Yeah, bad algae can definitely affect growth in a negative. Um, sexual dimorphism, meaning male, female, no effect. Flow rate of, void, of water, we already said with the Seston flux equation that absolutely flow rate, the more flow you have in the face of good algae, the, the more growth you're gonna have. The more dead end creek you're in, the, uh, the less so. Shell color, no effect on growth. Unless of course that the shell color uh, is part of the genetics for fast growth. So the genetics, the next one, the genetics. If you take oysters that were the fastest growing of a batch and set them aside and you breed them, there's a chance that you can breed fast growth. We're, we're gonna be working on that more, uh, more calculated in the next couple of years where we're taking these fast growing oysters and, and using them for brood stock to see if we can get more and more to be these fast kids, we always get about 10% that grow so much faster than the rest. They just whew, blow off the, the chart and we should start looking at the genetics. And if it has a color morph, it might transfer the color morph and the genetics like the, brown, the uh, black line with the disease resistance did. Stocking density in aquaculture gear can definitely affect growth rate. You can actually tailor it. If you put a lot in a bag, you, you can get smaller but cuppy oysters. Whereas if you put fewer in, you can sometimes you get these things that look like bananas. Um, but if you put one oyster in a cage all alone, it won't grow into a big oyster just because you gave it all that room. So there's a law of diminishing returns with stocking density. But I would say that 
uh, you can overstock and it will affect the growth rate. Stock market prices, everything is affected by stock market prices. We know that. Water temperature definitely uh, affects growth. Uh, you're not going to get growth in the wintertime. They're going to hibernate and they're going to stop growing. They're going to come up when it's pretty cold. You know, they'll come up in, in, in March uh, and they'll start growing and you'll see this dramatic new shell uh, growth on them pretty early. Spawn date. Spawn date does have an effect on growth rate. We spawn very early. We give our seed to everybody very early. This year at, at Tiana, especially, well, unbelievable oysters were grown there in seven months. And that was the earliest seed from the earliest spawn date. P political affiliation uh, affects everything in our lives. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, what does SPAT stand for? Anyone know what SPAT stands for? There's a couple of things it stands for. What does it stand for? Suffolk Project Aquaculture Training. Wow, that's great. You know, it used to be South Hole Project and Aquaculture Training, and they ch made me change it because we went maybe a little bit farther out of town. And uh, all the old folks in the program still call it South Hole Project and Aquaculture Training. A lot of the logos that we have still say that, but it is Suffolk Project now. And it's also, SPAT is the, is the term for newly created seed, uh, shellfish seed in the environment. So that's SPAT or SPAT fall. So that was our final. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, open it up if anyone has any questions. Otherwise, uh, we're getting ready for the holidays. I think we'll, I will uh, send out uh, some recipes and Darcy, who, who never fails to send everybody awesome emails. We get the greatest emails from Darcy. I don't have an email list anymore. I mean, Darcy does everything for, you know, I, I just sit with my, I just sit and burn wood. You see, I got my, where am I? I got my wood stove going there. Oh, uh, everything looks so nice there. Yeah, what are we? When's the invite? We'll have you over. For, yeah, house. we'll have you over for dinner. You yeah, mean the biggest it. test wasn't that all of you guys sat through all of his jokes yeah. for yet another year? I know it's good job, guys. We it's love good. him. He's awesome. Yeah. So uh, listen, the amount of stuff that comes out of your mouth, and I'm sitting here listening. Sorry, I had to walk away a few times with the dog, but it's just it's just amazing all the knowledge that you have. Well, look. Here's the thing is that it's a quirky field. Almost nobody in the country does it. We are a group that's learning this very cool, but it's a new language. I mean, it's like anything else. It's like anything else. And the great thing about life is that, and I gotta say the internet's fascinating. Uh, if it wasn't for the internet, I wouldn't be able to fix half of the broken stuff that I have. And, and that's been a lot of fun. And that's <laughs> a language too. I'll have to tell you the, uh, the, the vacuum sealer saga that, that oh, no. yeah, that was, all, that was one of my crowning achievements when it's <laughs> the air out this bag of string, I don't know, pretzels. <laughs> oh, it works. I did it. Mm. But, um, you know, with aquaculture, I think that the, there are people in the SPAT program that have heard more information than you would learn in, in grad school. And, you know, you don't have to retain it, but it's always a quest. It's a quest to learn stuff. And over time, the things that are most important, you will retain. Okay. I, yeah. I happen to, my, my, my dad used to say a couple things. One of them was that he was full of useless knowledge. My dad would say the same thing. <gasps> That's yeah. exactly what yeah. But he also said, the more you know, the less you pay. So it's hard to put those two things in, 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 in the right, you know, uh, try to figure that out. But I will yeah. say that uh, the natural world, there's so much information. I mean, it's just like almost impossible to know everything. Study invertebrate zoology and there's one of everything. 
every, every, everything and all these different things. So as we're looking at a couple of these things, like a clam, an oyster, a scallop, we can try to learn more and more about it so that we can not only grow it garden style, but when the need comes up, which the need seems to be coming up, we can start addressing uh, how, how, to, how to do that. So, yeah. you know, I, I just enjoy it because uh, I think the single biggest reason I enjoy teaching it is what I said before, you must believe everything I tell you. Okay. And, and that, that, that just makes me, you know, that swells my head to the size of a basket. <laughs> and, and it's only when I get called on that I get something wrong and I'm, I'm learning every day. And I learn from the group every day. I might not learn a whole lot of new biology, but we are working on new biology. You know, we wrote a paper with SPAT, SPAT member on conditioning scallops for reproduction using light. And we're the only paper that came out with the base scallop with that paper and it was done in SPAT. And so, you know, we had an idea, but we proved it and it was published. So it's in the, it's in, uh, I think that's in the Velliger magazine. And, uh, you know, we can do that anytime if people want to be more uh, research oriented. I, I like hands on stuff. I just like to do this because uh, people can do it without, you know, that's just why when I'm reading this thing, and it was, uh, it was this one, it was, um, well, metamorphosis and shellfish is irreversible and causes significant internal morphological, that, that starts to sound like science and, 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 and schoolwork and busy work. I did that just to throw that in there for, for, cause I can, I could say it in a much simpler way, like a caterpillar and a butterfly. When you witness metamorphosis, it's this explosion of change that is fascinating to look at. And that would have made more sense than you know, so. <laughs> But it's there for you. And, and, and again, when you're in a social setting, you can do that for about five minutes and then they hate you. And then you go back to, you know, the other way of speaking and then they like you again. So yeah. if you happen to be hanging out with the one that never switches, just walk away from him or her. <laughs> I heard recently, I watched uh, an early video of Rory when Chris Smith was Marine Program Director. They were talking about SPAT and you were out in front of, uh, you know, the South Hole town office and, and he referred to, and I've, I've never heard it referred to as the special project in aquaculture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. he got it wrong. Do you yeah. remember that? Yeah. yeah. That's good. That's good. Oh, there goes the dog again. Okay. I got to get him. He's outside. Okay. Thank you so, so much, Kim. So listen, we all, there's always a way of getting in touch. We're never asleep at the wheel. Feel free to reach out and have a, Great holiday, everybody. If you need anything, just let me know. And uh, we're, we're, we're on 24 hour call, as I found out, because every day of vacation, I've been back at the Marine Center at least once. For, but that's okay. I'm eight minutes away now. I'm not an hour. <laughs> Beautiful. Good. And we have dogs and everything that you can. Yeah, play. we got a pup. Have a great weekend. Good, good. Oh, we have a golden retriever. Yeah. Marlon, yeah. What is yeah. it? Eight months? Eight months. A little over eight months. He's now. great and he's a handful. <laughs> Mom, come here. So cute. Show him a picture.